and welcome to another episode of Fast Forward, a podcast from QSR Magazine, where we talk to the founders, innovators, and entrepreneurs behind some of the world's most exciting fast casual restaurant concepts. My name is Sam Okus. I am the editor of QSR and the editorial director of Food News Media. Today, I'm sharing a conversation with Matt Friedman. He is the co-founder and CEO of Wing Zone, a wings fast casual that has really specialized in college markets across the U.S. Now, take with me just a quick detour. Uh, I want to take you back, actually, to my college days. Uh, so back then, you know, I, I was your typical college student in terms of what I was eating. Not very healthy, I will tell you that. Uh, you know, so pretty typical in my house of friends was maybe a stack of hot and ready pizzas from Little Caesars, or, you know, we were pretty fond of uh, DP dough. This was a great uh, calzone delivery concept uh, where I went to school at Ohio University. Uh, and, you know, sometimes maybe it was late at night, we would go up to Big Mama's Burritos. Uh, you know, lots of, you know, pretty standard kind of college student food. We weren't too concerned about things like, well, say health, uh, but we were, you know, wanting to look for something cheap, convenient, accessible, and most importantly, delicious. I bring all that up because Wingzone launched in a college market. Matt Friedman co-founded the concept in Gainesville, Florida in 1993 uh, while he was a senior at the University of Florida. Uh, and they really specialized in college markets as they've grown. The second market they entered was Tallahassee, where Florida State is. Uh, and there's been several other markets uh, with, with colleges where Wingzone has really targeted. And it's been a really successful growth strategy for them. Wings on a college campus makes a lot of sense. But something else that they have done that is really smart, was smart back in the 90s, and is especially smart today as they really specialize in delivery. Um, so this conversation that I had with Matt back at the NRA show in May in Chicago, I thought was really interesting on a few levels. First off, um, just how to operate in the unique college market. You know, there's a lot of um, challenges that are kind of inherent with those markets. You have college students who are maybe, you know, not exactly uh, willing to pony up some money. Um, also, the hours are pretty wild. You have to kind of be open late night. And then also, you know, it's very much a feast or famine as Matt says in this conversation. Summertime comes and a lot of students clear out. Then, of course, you also have to really uh, reach a new market every four years. You have a new demographic that's coming in and then uh, your old demographic going out. Uh, but I really also enjoyed this conversation, too, because delivery is such a hot button topic today. Everybody is trying to figure out how they can master off premises and especially delivery. And Matt has some really great advice when it comes to how to run a delivery program at your restaurant. So I started by asking Matt why he wanted to open a restaurant while he was still in college. You know, I, I really felt that I understood the market after being there for three or four years. I understood what was lacking there. I um, have a lot of family in upstate New York, and uh, as a kid growing up, just became an avid fan and eater of buffalo wings. Oh, sure. And uh, it was lacking in this college market, 40,000 students. Um, I think one of the most innovative things we did was that when we started in 1993, we focused entirely on takeout and delivery. Mm -hmm. And as you look at 25 years later, like that entire trend has like flourished now. Right. It's the trend. It's what everyone's talking about. So for us, it was uh, a simple menu, uh, a great product and understanding our target market. Okay. And now were you and your friends just a bunch of you know, wings eaters and it just seemed like to, you saw all these potential customers around you? Is that kind of how it worked? You know, I always had this vision and dream of, of being an entrepreneur and starting my own business. I, it didn't necessarily, you know, start with I'm going to start a restaurant. But um, it was really my idea. I started it on a simple eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. Mm -hmm. uh, the business model 25 years later hasn't changed that much. It was authentic wings and a variety of flavors focused in core markets with a delivery focus. Yeah. And I was fortunate that um, a fraternity brother of mine seemed to share the same passion as I did for starting a business. And so we have been amazing friends and business partners for 25 years, which by itself is pretty amazing. I was going to say, there's a lot of uh, friendships that ended over uh, business partnerships. <laughs> yeah, I think what has made our partnership so successful is, A, we have very different personalities. Mm -hmm. We have uh, very different skill sets. And um, we stay out of each other's sandbox, so to speak. So my role in the company is really geared around... Um, you know, real estate, uh, franchise, sales and development, operations, and he really is more on the technology, um, IT, 
uh, legal and accounting side. So okay. we could probably not be any more different in what our passions are when it comes to the sure, business. But very complimentary. Agree. Yeah, yeah. How much has the wings industry changed in 25 years? I mean, when you think about it, a chicken wing, it's like, it's a chicken wing. How much does a chicken wing change? But I imagine, obviously, the sort of promotion and, and service model of it has changed. But in terms of the actual chicken wing, how do you evolve sort of that as a business model? Yeah, that's such a great question. And I think if you look at our history, um, our name is Wing Zone. We've always been kind of a, a leader uh, in the, the wing category, especially in our takeout delivery model. But I think what's happened over the course of the last many years is there's now different taste profiles in the different types of wings that people can get, mm -hmm. uh, different flavor profiles. Obviously, the cost of the product is... Um, is a reality. You mm -hmm. know, our cost on the product have gone up uh, four to five times uh, what we once paid. For an wow. example, we used to pay when we started 40 to 50 cents a pound. Now we pay $2 to $2 and 20 cents a pound. Wow. Um, we've really been kind of pioneers in uh, innovation. Mm -hmm. We uh, obviously people know what boneless wings are, although for the listeners out there, it's not really a boneless wing. <laughs> it's a chicken breast chunk. You just blew a is, lot of minds. <laughs> right. No one's deboning a chicken wing. <laughs> but um, we recently rolled out a zesty breaded wing, which is taking our chicken tender breading and putting it on our uh, on our original wings. Uh, we have rolled out a char grilled wing which is a little bit of a healthier option. People always say, I love to grill wings at home. Well, Wing Zone's really launched that product and a little different one. And uh, we have a brand new product that's coming out this fall, which is called a thigh wing. Oh, interesting. So people always talk about thighs and dark meat, and you know, there's a lot of talk about it's healthier or it's got more flavor. And so we've come up with a really innovative product that is being called a thigh wing, mm. and it looks like a wing, uh -huh. but it tastes a little different. Okay. What kind of demographic do you think that's going to appeal to? Um, you know, I think if, if you look at one of the things that we've been able to really study and understand is the, the younger demographic, if you take the high school, college uh, age person, they are typically a boneless eater, mm -hmm. meaning chicken tenders, boneless wings, uh, maybe chicken breast sandwiches. Uh, as you get to a little bit of an older or even ethnic customer base, uh, it becomes more of a bone-in product. Okay. So for us, uh, when we look at zesty breaded wings, which is a bone-in wing, or uh, a thigh wing, or a char-grilled wing, it caters to a little bit of an older demographic, maybe somewhere in their 30s and 40s. Okay. Gotcha. So you guys opened your first restaurant in Gainesville, 1993. Correct. At what point did you realize you had a hit on your hands and started to grow this thing? Well, I wish I could tell everyone that uh, there was this master plan <laughs> of, you know, dominating the world. But it was really about learning how to have one successful restaurant. Okay. And I think for so many people out there, they want to, they ask the question of how do you go from one to two or from two to 10 or from 10 to a hundred. And I think for us, uh, it was humble beginnings we uh, worked in the restaurant, we were behind the counter, we did whatever it took to really kind of make that restaurant successful. Mm -hmm. I think for us, it was really when we opened our third restaurant. Okay. We had opened a second one in Gainesville, and our third one opened in uh, Tallahassee, Florida. And it was finally where we had taken what we have, had learned from the first two and built the restaurant the right way, picked the right location, understood the product mix, and from there, it really was kind of a major step forward in uh, profitability, success, and understanding the model from there. Sure. At what point did you really kind of go all in on the college town market in particular? Uh, our first nine or ten restaurants were in uh, major college markets in the southeast. Mm -hmm. And that was a great fit for us back then. I think the thing back then was that college markets didn't have a lot of the competition that they do now with a lot of on-campus food choices. So for us, it was a, a domination in those markets. Then we started to expand in certain uh, other markets, more urban type settings, um, density of apartments and townhomes and uh, businesses and stuff like that. So 
you know, our, our expansion now is kind of a blend between um, urban dense areas and college markets. Okay. And how do you find those two sort of are different or are the same? I mean, business is so unique in a college town, I imagine. It is. I think the college town is a little bit of a feast or famine. Yeah. You know, we work on about a nine month uh, calendar and then typically our sales will drop off in your May, June and July. Mm hmm. Um, I think residential markets or urban type markets are just more consistent on a on a um, you know twelve month calendar. The other thing that's challenging about college markets, but I actually look at it as a positive, is we have a a, a new customer base coming in every year. Oh, yeah. It could be you know three thousand, five thousand, ten thousand new people that may not know who we are. Sure. So we've got to get involved in them on an early basis. Uh, to write, try to capture them for the next four to five years. Yeah. How do you do that? I mean, because uh, my experience with college students haven't been one previously, and I lived in a college town for a long time. I'm in a college town now. They're fickle customers. I mean, so I'm in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and restaurants close all the time because it's, you know, the leases are really expensive right there on the main strip, and college students are kind of hard to capture to some degree. So how do you sort of keep that up and build that business and then build some loyalty from it? Well, you know, our, our philosophy on real estate is that we want to get into great real estate, but we don't always have to be on Maine and Maine. Okay. You know, our, some of the important things for us is the ability for parking, for takeout, uh, delivery drivers to have access in and out. So we're, we'll typically look to locate within about a mile to a mile and a half of campus. Okay. So we can beat the, the high rent uh, walking traffic type of stuff. As far as marketing to students, listen, I still believe it's a combination of local store marketing, um, a lot of food giveaways as you do a lot of sponsorships on campus. You got to get food in people's mouths and really get them uh, kind of hooked on that side. Obviously, you know, the college student lives in a digital mindset. You got to have the right app. You got to have the right rewards program. Um, you've got to obviously embrace some third party delivery, yeah. which is a big trend right now. Um, but ultimately, we have a product mix that they want. Yeah, sure. And it's just about kind of getting the word out there. Uh, we hit hard in the residence halls. We get very involved in the Greek system. Okay. Uh, well, we'll do a lot of their events and things like that because at the end of the day, uh, they're a target customer base for us. And uh, most of our restaurants are open till 2 a.m., so we're definitely a late night type of option for people as well. Sure. Always popular on college campuses. Correct. So you guys... You, you built this restaurant on chicken wings, but have you also evolved the menu beyond wings to include other uh, chicken items and things like that? And how does that sort of perform on the menu at your restaurants? You know, I, I think that menu innovation is a key factor. Yeah. I, I think that you've got, if you take four people in a, in a, in a dorm setting, uh, you may have one that's vegetarian, one that wants to eat a little bit healthier. So from our side, um, we've rolled out uh, a multitude of items. Uh, we've rolled out an Angus burger, which honestly is a phenomenal product uh, that that our customer base really wants. Uh, hand breaded chicken tenders. We've done some healthier things like grilled wraps and salads as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, our menu, we, we cook uh, about 16 items. So I believe that we really tackle a large audience by saying, hey, I want something and I want something else. And mm -hmm. we can we can really live in that world. I think flavor um, evolution is important. Wing Zone has 17 unique proprietary flavors, um, but they're not just all buffalo style. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got things like sweet samurai or liquid gold or Thai chili. And I think that that's really an important part as well. Yeah. Does that make the restaurant overly complex with the burgers and wraps and things like that? Or, I mean, how simple do you try to keep this concept, I guess? You know, I think we've done a phenomenal job in our processes, uh, our kitchen layouts, the way that we kind of uh, buy our products with some of our key suppliers, keeping to a tight spec. Um, within three to four hours of some training of someone within the wing zone, we can have them taking orders, cooking orders, um, understanding some of the processes. So um, 
I really believe that the restaurant, Wing Zone restaurants are simpler to run than the menu may dictate. Oh, okay. So I think it may become to the consumer of, wow, look at all these options. But from an operational standpoint, I mean, we're buttoned up. Understand that we've been doing it for 25 years. Sure. And every day you make improvements. Yeah, yeah. I want to talk about delivery. You guys were doing delivery from day one. And now it's sort of, it must be kind of funny for you to see how big delivery is, has become with the third party services. You guys, I mean, you must love this because you guys are just, you, you are so buttoned up, but to use your term, uh, when it comes to the delivery model, how much has that kind of changed your approach to things and how much do you just, are, are you enjoying, I guess, this moment of delivery being so popular? You know, I think everything's cyclical. I yeah. think that... Um it's really been amazing to watch the consumer demand of wanting things delivered to their home office, you know, some event and something like that. I think people are busier than ever. Um, I think people are staying home a little bit more, whether they're watching Netflix or watching the game on TV rather than maybe going to it. Um, we have honestly uh, been in the delivery business for 25 years and we are delivery experts. We understand how to package the product. We understand how it works with uh, routing drivers and letting customers know when their order's on the way. Um, I think that what's happened is we've just opened ourselves up to a wider audience. Now, to be honest with you, there obviously is more competition for us. Mm -hmm. You know, where maybe in the market we were the only place to get true authentic buffalo wings and a variety of other items, now there may be more choices. Mm -hmm. But I think what, what we have going for us is we've really kind of built that stable base. We also allow our customers to either order directly from Wing Zone or we do a hybrid model where we're taking some of that third party business as well. Okay. We don't believe that we're ever going to go exclusively third party. Um, because we've really built our foundation on delivery. Mm -hmm. But to say that we're not going to embrace third party, um, I think would be a little short-sighted. I know there are some other brands out there maybe that have been fighting that. I've read some things about like Domino's or Jimmy John's where they're saying, hey, we're only going to do our own delivery. Yeah. But for Wing Zone, we feel like there's an opportunity to increase sales and, and customer base. Do you think it's a marketing fee? I mean, that's everybody's talking about how much this takes wipes out your profit margin yes. or the fee that you give these services, but they have to do it because it's like if you're not on the service, then the customer's not seeing you. Does that, is that how it feels to you? Yeah, in fact, from an accounting perspective, uh, if we pay 20% of an order, we allot 10% of that into marketing. Okay. Um, because we're not marketing the third parties. Like, they're marketing themselves. We're not, in, we're not letting our customers know hey, you know, order on this service or that service. Um, the other reality is we've already got built in things like rent and utilities and labor. So it is an additional sale for us. For our business, we look at third-party sales being anywhere between 10 to 25% of our overall revenue. That's a healthy number. Yeah. And I think sometimes you, you have to be careful that it doesn't become the driver of your business. Right. So for us, we do that by offering our own delivery, sometimes offering exclusively only specials to order from wingzone.com that mm -hmm. are not available through third party services. Interesting. Okay, I feel like you're the guy that has the secret sauce to delivery, and I feel like we we've we got to uh, spill your secrets here because I have this conversation with operators all the time. They're so frustrated with the third parties, and you know some of them are thinking, "Well, what if I just wanted to do this in house?" Be honest. How complicated is it to run your own delivery program? I would say that most will fail. Okay. I think it's understanding the hiring and training of your drivers, mm -hmm. understanding the technology side, things like driver insurance and work comp and other things like it. I mean, you're adding a whole new dynamic to the business. You know, from our side, um, we really believe that that driver is an integral part of our business. If you think about it, they're the ones that have the interaction directly with the customer at the door. Right, right. And so I think that's where we can win over third parties because we've all had those experience of someone delivering their food in their slippers or 
<laughs> yeah. you know, just rolled out of bed and, right. you know, who knows what their car looks like? Is it safe or any of those things? So um, I think the technology piece is also critical. Most POS companies out there are not set up for delivery. Mm-hmm. And I think what has made WingZone unique is although we buy an off-the-shelf uh, software, it is customized to us. Okay. So we know everything from where are our drivers out in the market, how to route them, uh, even how to cash drivers out. There's so many different nuances that you don't think about. Sure, yeah. It's very different than someone eating in your restaurant or doing a takeout. Um, and so I, I welcome people to try it. <laughs> I think they're going to find that, wow, this is really hard. The other thing yeah. that I will say is you've got to make an investment in delivery. And what I mean by that is you can't just say, well, I'm going to throw on a driver and I'm going to start delivering. You know, you have to be able to staff it so uh, you're, you're delivering on a great customer experience by offering delivery, you know, speed of service, order accuracy, right. um, and a lot of those things. And you can't just throw a driver on. Right, I right. think it's much more than that. How many drivers per store do you typically have? Uh, typically on a shift, we'll run anywhere from three to six drivers. Wow. So, um, you know, it's not just, uh, you know, like I said, just putting one driver on the road. Right, right. You know, our business is dominated uh, more so in the dinner and late night. Mm. So for lunch, we may only run, you know, two or three drivers. But in dinner, we may run, you know, five or six because that's typically our best time. Okay, gotcha. I imagine, too, with technology and data, this must help you kind of perfect that delivery model, right? Because when you think about geography and how do you get this order to that part of town and that part of town. That's right. So how much has that kind of changed over the years as you get these technological and data tools to be able to use? Well, we've always lived in a a sector analysis or a street database. So we know when someone calls in, I'm at 123 Main Street, are you in our area or out of our area? Okay. Um, the other side of just the technology or, or marketing side is when a customer calls WingZone or a delivery restaurant, they're happy to provide their phone number, their address, you know, maybe their email address if they're ordering online. So that data is so key for us. Mm. We can understand how to market to them, how often they order, what are their preferences in the menu. And I think that there's a, a huge component of that that we've really embraced upon. Yeah. Now, where we used to do a lot of direct mail um, has been replaced with text and email, but we're able to send things to people, whether it's their birthday, whether uh, we haven't seen them in 90 days. And so we wouldn't have that data or information if we were not delivering. Yeah, sure. I imagine too, so off-premises right now in general is like the buzzword, right? So everybody's talking about it as it relates to not only third-party delivery, but mobile ordering in general, as well as uh, we're seeing a lot of fast casuals getting into drive through now um, and take out all that stuff. I mean, do you find that beyond delivery, does this idea of off-premises kind of, is it, is it changing the way you look at the business? Are you guys trying to wrap your head around sort of the customer experience and how they want to experience the wing zone? You know, I, I think for us, We've got to be careful that we, we're not all things to all people. Mm-hmm. We tested drive through It was not successful for okay. us. We struggled on service times. We're a cook-to-order concept. So our wait times, which could be five to ten minutes, didn't work on a, on a drive through setting. In, in our model, and part of my job as the visionary and CEO of the company is to make sure that we are true to the brand mm-hmm. and true to the model. So for us, it's really about – it is about off-premise, but it's about providing – uh, our customers with the right product at a fair price delivered to their home office or some of those events. Now, the thing that uh, a lot of people will talk about is, well, what sort of other off-premise works? Mm-hmm. Well, because of our product being um, so fun and group-oriented, uh, tailgating has been a huge play for us. Good point, yeah. So um, whether it's NFL games or college games or some festivals or things like that, so we've really pushed hard on that, where typically that was driven by maybe barbecue or other things like that. We've really tapped into that, and that's a great way for us to get more of our product in people's mouths in a very casual setting. Sure, and you guys are all over SEC and ACC country. I imagine that's <laughs> that doesn't hurt. No, it doesn't. <laughs> Obviously, uh, people love to have their favorite uh, 
libation and uh-huh. uh, and enjoy some good food. But you know, listen, we we're based in Atlanta, Georgia. We started in uh, college football kind of mecca, mm-hmm. and these uh, tailgate and and football games are truly um, like a Super Bowl every weekend. Sure, yeah, it's funny. I mean, I think. A couple years ago, I felt like, you know, quality was kind of the word on everybody li- everybody's lips. But it seems to me like the word experience is sort of what it comes down to anymore. Because as I see it, you know, the QSR space is to some degree, leveled the playing field through technology, whereas before Fast Casual was able to you know, stick a claim in quality and call it a day, and now with technology, QSR is kind of caught up, but now everybody's, the differentiator becomes experience. Does that, is that something that resonates with you? Is that something you're thinking about a lot, just the general customer experience? I think it's, it's a better word because if you just have a quality product, which I think is just foundational like if 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 you want to get into a a successful restaurant brand you better have a great quality product okay so that's just kind of entry level base foundation but that by itself isn't enough anymore Mm -hmm. and so i think experience is is probably the right word Uh, maybe expectation um, and you can group a bunch of things into experience but i do think the ordering process and how simple it is for people to order um, is very important. Uh, at Wing Zone, our, our overall revenue is driven by about 40% of some sort of mobile or online order. Wow, 40%. And, you know, if you think about it, that's a huge number that continues to grow a couple percent per year. Wow. So, you know, it's not going to be too long where more than 50% of our, of our revenue is being driven by um, some sort of mobile or online order. Yeah. That's crazy. I mean, do you think what's what do you think is going to be like industry average? I mean, is are we getting to that point where the vast majority of orders you think are going to be digital or mobile? Listen, my, my take on this one is that people don't like to talk on the phone anymore. <laughs> it's sad, but you know, when's the last time you know you text uh, with your friend? Or, millennials, man. You know, <laughs> um, but even listen, even you know, my parents who are in their seventies, yeah. it's like I used to call them more. Now we text a little bit more. Yeah. Um, so I just think that that is kind of the trend. Um, and so I, I, I think that mobile experience of how people order, I think also loyalty or what we call rewards is driven by that. Yeah. Um, you know, right or wrong, we don't really have a rewards program that's based on people calling in. Right. Yeah. Our rewards program is driven by, do they order online and they get so many points for each order? Right. And we want to obviously control that. There's a, there's a bunch of reasons why. Obviously, there's a labor component. But more importantly than that, it is about order accuracy. Yeah. You know, someone calls in and you can't hear them that well. It's, it's the customer's really dictating the order. Mm-hmm. And I just believe that that is really... Many years ago, it was get my order right. Now, that's also just part of the basic experience. Like, you right. better get the order right. Right. You, you mentioned labor. I know that that's like this huge challenge that everybody is facing right now is getting quality employees. But, uh, I, you know, the, on the flip side, it's you almost don't even need as many employees with all of this technology that's helping you out. Are we losing sort of the human element of the fast casual industry and the restaurant industry in general? Or, I mean, is there a place for that human component still? And do you have to sort of fight for that, especially in this tight labor market? I think the reality is, is that to be successful and profitable long-term in the restaurant segment, you've got to look at how do you pull labor out of the restaurant? Yeah. But we've made some bold moves where we, we really have no interest in having kiosks in our restaurant. We ultimately want that interaction if someone's going to come in and place an order. Uh, we deliver food to the table. Um, so we, we have some different touch points that I think are, are there. But um, as rents go up and other costs go up, um, and, it, and it's a price-sensitive market, especially the ones that we're in, the one area that we can continue to control or try to reduce is labor. Yeah. Um, there's no doubt with technology and all these things that we're able to run fewer people within the restaurant. And at the end of the day, um, that's a necessity right now. I don't believe that it necessarily means that uh, the, the quote unquote experience is different. Um, so from our side, 
um, we're seeing a reduction in labor. We're seeing a reduction in number of people we need to run per shift or yeah. hire. And I think that that is a very important part of it. Okay. Talking about challenges, what's keeping you up at night these days? I mean, labor seems to be on everybody's lips, but are there other things that are kind of facing big challenges these days? You know, um, we've had a phenomenal, we had a great 2018 and a great, great 2019 um, opening uh, one to two stores a month. Wow. So we're finding uh, some both domestic and international franchisees that like our model. We are a small footprint. So we're 12 to 1,500 square feet, so we're not building these big restaurants. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I think in general, it's um, really understanding uh, the consumer trends. But I love where we're going with menu innovation. I love where we're going with technology. And we've actually seen a reduction in food cost because of just some buying power increases there. So, you know, the one thing we're not hearing out there uh, is, you know, major food increases, which is very positive. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the pricing, the price point to the consumer is still um, a relatively uh, sensitive topic. Okay, yeah. And I think that is where you've got to balance this, I need to run a certain food cost or food and labor, but ultimately still, um, you know, increase sales and, and look at uh, increasing profitability. Mm-hmm. So, um, I think that's that's it. But I, I think we, we're very focused on the direction that we're going. Um, and I'm very excited about kind of where things are headed right now. That's good. Man, yeah. you're an optimistic person. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> There's not a lot keeping you up at night. Although I'm interested in, you know, chicken wings a couple of years ago, that was like, you know, the prices were, were skyrocketing. I mean, you mentioned it's gone up four or five times since you opened. Uh, how do you sort of kind of approach that idea of increasing prices because, you know, McDonald's sort of famously, like, if they raise the price of their quarter pounder it'll buy, you know, a nickel, I think they would lose a huge chunk of business from people who are just, like, refuse to pay extra money. Yeah, you know, we um, we typically set prices on an annual basis, and we'll take a 3 to 5% increase each year. Okay. Um, just for cost of living increases, but we don't believe in, in radical changes. I think what happens sometimes is people just maybe make a 10 or 20% price increase, and, and you're really alienating people when you do that. Mm-hmm. Um, our core product is wings. It represents about 40% of our overall purchases. And so one of the things that we've done from a purchasing standpoint is really lock in a fixed price for a long-term contract of 18 months. Okay. So we take the volatility of the market where it's high um, or lower and just really stabilize it. Okay. I think that that's an important part of, you know, why to be involved in a, in a franchise or so taking advantage of some of that buying power because we can't really have those fluctuations. It would, it would impact our restaurants too great. Okay. Gotcha. So last question for you, Matt. When you think about the future, what do you see? I mean, where do you see Wing Zone going in the future? Where do you, what do you see sort of the trends of the industry and how that will affect Wing Zone? We're obviously dealing with a, with a very strong economy right now. Yeah. But I think competition is getting fierce. You, you know, I think you're going to see some, some change struggle. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the ones that really have a solid foundation – um, and understand exactly what their model is and not be all things to all people are going to continue to thrive. Mm. I think that if you look at our model, which is core delivery, um, certain core markets, understanding our product mix and a small footprint, I think that that's a very important part of where we're going. I think footprint is important. Mm. I think sometimes if you look at what's happened in the course of the last maybe five years, or longer, um, restaurants were overbuilt. Mm-hmm. They were overbuilt in uh, maybe their decor and finishes. They were overbuilt in their size. I think for us, it's about a consistent, well-designed restaurant, but we don't need to have marble floors um, and some uh, imported uh, Italian wall covering. Sure, yeah. You know, I mm-hmm. think simplicity is important. Mm-hmm. That's great. Well, Matt, that's all I got for you. Really appreciate your time today. Thanks for sitting down. I did too. Thank you. 
There you go. That's my conversation with Matt Friedman, the co-founder and CEO of Wingzone. As always, go to qsrmagazine.com for all the news and insights you need on the QSR and fast casual restaurant industries. Go to qsrmagazine.com slash podcast for the full fast forward archive. Uh, Also, subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening to it and uh, send some feedback. You can email me at sam at qsrmagazine.com either with feedback or if you have some uh, thoughts on who you'd like to see interviewed on the podcast. That's all for today. We'll talk to you again next time.